Well, good morning, Life Church, and good morning to all of you who are joining us online today. It's good to have you. Hope you're having a great Sunday. Maybe we can make it just a little bit better. You know, a while back we started this series called The God Questions, and last week we began by asking this question, how can I understand the Bible better? And last week we saw something very clearly, that the first century Christians had a very different foundation for their faith than most of us would say today because many of us were raised to believe that the only foundation for Christian faith is the Bible. But the early Christians didn't have a Bible. That didn't come along until around the fourth century. But what they based their faith on was an historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the resurrection is why they chose to continue following Jesus even after he was gone. Then the Holy Spirit came and the Holy Spirit launches the church supernaturally in Jerusalem. Thousands of people within Judea embrace the message of Jesus. But remember, this is a very Jewish area. So it's no surprise that Christianity in the first century had a distinctly Jewish flavor to it. After all, most of the early Christians were Jewish and most of the Christian leaders stayed in the Judea area. So the church felt kind of Jewish. It was very difficult for them to unwind from thinking as a Jewish person to begin thinking as a Christian. So as you might expect, they began to mix and match covenants, mix and match the old with the new. Now, when I talk about mixing and matching covenants, I'm talking about God's covenant with Israel made at Mount Sinai with Moses, where God gave him the Ten Commandments. Soon after that, they were given civil laws and rules to live by, dietary laws, all kinds of things like that. But then Jesus came along and said, I'm establishing a brand new covenant for the whole world. But for these Jewish believers, their consciences were hardwired to what we call the Old Testament. They just call it the law and the prophets. It was their scripture. They'd been raised to believe certain things and behave in certain ways so it was very difficult for them to break away from the law, from the old covenant way of life. But eventually they did break some of those habits and from the old way of thinking. And the truth is though, that this doesn't end there. Even for us, there are some mix and match habits that many of us need to break as well. So we'll go back to the story. Thousands of people in Jerusalem and around Judea become Christians. They all become believers and followers of Jesus now. But then persecution breaks out because the religious leaders that crucified Jesus just kind of freaked out. Now, why did they do that? Because suddenly there were more Jesus followers than ever before. They thought that killing Jesus would solve the problem. But then Jesus raises from the dead. Now they've got real problems. So a persecution broke out against what they called the way. They didn't call it the church yet. The word Christian wasn't really even in use at that time. It was called the way. Now the ringleader of this persecution of the church was a young man by the name of Saul. Saul was from Tarsus and he was a very, very passionate Pharisee. Saul was an expert at keeping the old covenant, the Jewish law. In fact, one of his letters, he basically says, I don't want to brag, but I was like the best of the best. I was the best law keeper you've ever seen. I went to the right school. I was trained by the right mentors. So Saul of Tarsus was an extraordinary law keeper by anyone's standards. And he saw Christianity as a threat to Judaism. So he decided he was going to single-handedly, if he had to, shut the whole thing down. So about three to five years after the resurrection, Saul comes out and says, enough of this Jesus thing. And in Acts chapter nine and verse number one, it puts it this way. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now he's talking about all the believers, all the followers of Jesus, not just the original 12 apostles. So he set out to destroy the church, thinking that he's doing God a favor. Now verse two, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So Saul goes to the high priest and he basically says, I would like to be deputized. You know, I, send me out to fix this Jesus follower problem. Let me go Tommy Lee Jones on them. I'll search every warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, and doghouse. I'll chain them up, 
all those Christians, I'll bring them back here to Jerusalem so we can try them, put them in prison, maybe even put them to death. Now, why does Saul think that it's okay to leverage violence to do God's will? Well, because of what he'd read in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. There's lots of examples of violent there, violence there. So there's no issues of conscience in using violence. They'd already killed Jesus. They'd already killed a young follower of Jesus named Stephen. So Saul gets the permission that he asks for, and it's open season on the Jesus followers. And off Saul goes to Damascus, which is way north of Jerusalem. Then something happens on the way. Lots of us are familiar with this story. We've all read about it. And this has actually become a figure of speech, getting knocked off your high horse. Saul and his posse are on their way to Damascus. And here's how Acts chapter five records the happening there. It says, as he, meaning Saul, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I love this. Who are you, Lord? <laughs> Saul asks. Now, I, I, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now, Saul of Tarsus knows that this is a divine intervention and that God is the one that blinded him and that God is up to something here. And maybe, just maybe, he found himself on the wrong side of this battle. Now, while he's in Damascus, God taps a man named Ananias on the shoulder. He says, Annie, I've got a surprise for you. Saul of Tarsus is coming. You need to bring him a message from me. In Acts 9, 13, it says this, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. In other words, I know exactly who you're talking about. Then he adds some more because we love to give God information that we think he doesn't have. In verse 14, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. He's saying, I know who this guy is. Matter of fact, before you even interrupted me today, Lord, I was packing. We're all headed out to the timeshare out at Caesarea by the sea. The wife and the kids are already there because we knew that Saul of Tarsus was coming. Now you want me to meet with him? Are you kidding? Now look at verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles. Now this moment is really, really cool. Ananias decides to trust God and let Saul into his house. He's still a little bit nervous about all this, but he lays hands on him and he prays for him. And when he's done, Saul not only receives his physical sight back, but he opens his eyes with extraordinary God-given clarity regarding the old covenant and the new covenant between the old system of Jewish law and the new covenant that is brought about by Jesus. He also understood with great clarity the incompatibility of the old with the new. Now, while both are true, both are God-ordained, both are God-inspired, one has been fulfilled by Jesus. The page is turned. It's a new day. You cannot live under both covenants at the same time. Listen. I read the Old Testament. I learn from the Old Testament. There are lots of great examples for me in the Old Testament, but it must be read with New Testament eyes or it is conflicting and confusing and it always will be. You know how much Saul was transformed by this revelation? Saul went from leveraging violence to try to do God's will to never again using violence ever in God's name, never. Matter of fact, he writes some of the greatest words ever written on the subject of unconditional love. Some of you have used these words in your wedding ceremonies. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is never je jealous or envious. I use those words in every ceremony that I do for a wedding. Now here's the truth. You get nothing else today, get this. Saul immediately let go of God's temporary and conditional covenant with Israel even though he was a Jew. Saul immediately let go of God's temporary and conditional covenant with Israel to embrace God's permanent and unconditional covenant with the whole world. Saul went from this violent mentality of rid the nation of these pesky people to reach the nations with the message of God's grace and the love of Jesus. Now, Saul, who will later be named Paul, which is just his Roman name. He would be going, begin going by Paul. 
his Roman name. Now, now what I want to do is jump over to Peter, the Apostle Peter, whom we studied last week. Peter has become the lead guy in the Jerusalem church, the gathering of believers that's made up mostly of Jewish Christians. He's struggling with this whole mix and match thing as well. He too has been raised Jewish. So this is now about 10 years after the resurrection. <clears throat> now Peter, like most Jewish Christians around Judea, is still clinging to that old covenant with Israel while, <clears throat> while trying to mash it up with the stuff that Jesus taught. So God arranges an intervention for Peter. Peter travels up to Joppa to visit some friends, which is just a beach town that's not that far away. He goes up on the roof because most houses are in that area had kind of these rooftop terraces. <clears throat> so he's up on the roof enjoying some ocean breezes, probably smells the sense of, of lunch wafting up onto the rooftop there. Now in Acts chapter 10, it says that Peter fell into a trance. Verse 11 says it like this. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. Sounds to me like a video screen. God's going to show Peter a movie here. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. You see, Peter knows that to touch these animals, much less eat them, was forbidden by the Jewish law that he'd grown up with. Now God is saying something different? Now it's okay? Keep going. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Video screen goes up, and the movie is over. So this divine voice is saying, I want, Peter, I want you to now do what you've been told your whole life not to do. Did you get that? I'm telling you to now do what you've been told your whole life not to do. So of course, Peter is thinking what any one of us might think. Wait, wait a minute. Has God changed his mind? And this is part of the conflict with many of us who were raised in church. This conflict that we have with the Old Testament and the New Testament. Did God change his mind? The answer is no. God changed covenants. God changed covenants. The first one is over. The covenant that God established with the nation of Israel was a means to an end. And once Jesus fulfilled his divine part, the end for that covenant had come. Now, as soon as this vision is over, there's a knock on the door. Somebody yells upstairs, Peter, it's for you. He goes down, there's two men and a soldier at the door. They say, we're here on behalf of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion, and he's inviting you to his home to tell his family and his friends about Jesus. We know you, Peter, were with him from the beginning, but we've only heard bits and pieces. My master Cornelius is a God-fearing man, and we all want to know the rest of the story. <laughs> this is an interesting moment because obviously God is at work here, but there's a problem here. Peter had never stepped foot inside, inside a Gentile's home. Why? Because the old covenant was very, very clear. Don't contaminate yourself with Gentiles. They weren't allowed to associate with Gentiles and they certainly were not allowed to go into a Gentile's home. Now, if you remember, when Jesus was arrested and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law took him to Pontius Pilate, Pilate opens his door and says, come on in. And they all say, we can't go in the house, we'll get Gentile cooties. Can you come out here? That really happened. So the, the Jews would not cross the threshold of a Gentile's home. Why? Because they were crazy? Because they were narrow-minded? No. That's what the Old Covenant demanded of them. They were just obeying their scriptures. So now, Peter finds himself on the way to a Gentile's home. And he took a bunch of Jewish Christian friends with him. When they got to Cornelius' home, they threw open the door to welcome them. And Peter is standing there thinking, can I do this? Can I do this? If I step inside, there is no going back. My whole life I have been taught that this means I'm about to become unclean and I'll be unacceptable to God or to the spiritual community. But then he remembers that rooftop video from God. There's a new imperative from God. Everything is different from this point on. So he takes a deep breath 
and he crosses the threshold. Huge house, wall-to-wall -wall Gentiles. And his opening line is so offensive, uh, oh, so offensive, it helps us see the struggle that Peter is having to try to differentiate between the old and the new. And I'm sure he's just nervous, so we'll cut him a little slack. But all these Gentiles, they wanna hear the story of Jesus. And they're like, this is Peter. He's the walk on water guy. But here's Peter's opening line. You are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. He just lets them know, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be doing this. This is probably gonna cost me big time. Because his law, the Jewish law, was exclusive and it was excluding. He didn't misread it and he didn't misunderstand it. It was exclusive and it was excluding. And it was designed that way by God for a purpose and now he's being called to let go of all of that. And this line, this next line is even worse. He says, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. In other words, he's saying, until yesterday, I considered every one of you guys impure and unclean. And the Old Testament backed me up on this. It said, I can't go into your house because we're God's holy people. We don't eat your food. We don't drink your water. We don't marry your women. We don't eat your food. We don't do anything like you guys do it. Now remember, Peter's supposed to be helping them here. And they're probably like, okay, when do we get to the Jesus part? And Peter's obviously still struggling here. So he's probably thinking, man, when Jesus told us to go into all the world, I kind of thought he just meant go to the outskirts of the county. But maybe he meant go into the whole world. This is so intuitive to us, friends. Of course, God loves everybody. We all believe that God loves everybody, except that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not just teach that God loves everybody. The New Covenant teaches that God loves everybody. The Old Testament teaches that God loves mostly Jews. They were the chosen people of the Old Covenant and they, were, they got special treatment. It was a means to get to the eternal covenant with all people. And once that got here, this was God's way of bringing closure to the Old Covenant. Okay, now, Peter realized he's been daydreaming this whole time. He goes, oh, oh yeah, that's right. I'm here for you. Let me tell you about Jesus. So he tells them the entire story of Jesus from beginning all the way back on the banks of the Jordan River. And they're spellbound because they have only heard bits and pieces of the story. He finishes up and he says, and by the way, we, and he points to a couple of the guys that are with him. He says, we are witnesses of everything he did. In other words, he's, he's, he's saying, I'm not telling you what I heard about. I'm not telling you what I read about. I'm telling you what I saw, what we saw. He says, they killed him by hanging him on a cross. And based on what we talk, talked about last Sunday, what do you think the next part of that line is? But God raised him from the dead. That was their message. And it continued to be their message. Then suddenly, something unbelievable happens. It freaks everybody out. The same thing happened to these Gentiles that happened a dozen years ago when Jesus, I mean, when Peter and all the other followers were huddled in the upper room waiting and together there's a, the, the rushing of a mighty wind and the Holy Spirit comes and fills every one of them in the room. It happens again. Peter can't believe it. In fact, the group that was with, that was with him at the time were called the circumcised believers. That's an odd phrase, I know, the circumcised believers. Here's what that meant circumcised believer was a Jewish man who would become a Jesus follower. But they're still keeping the old covenant law and they're trying to do the new covenant at the same time. They're mixing and matching covenants. Acts chapter 10 verse 45 says, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. They're shocked because all they knew from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was, God doesn't treat everybody the same. We think that he does because we've never really looked at this fully with open eyes. But the people here who were closest to the action, they were correct about this. Under the Old Covenant, God was preparing something unique for the sake of all humanity. But he drew a circle around his people and said, you're chosen. You're not supposed to be like your neighbors. Don't let them in and you be careful when you go out. But now suddenly, all that has changed. And Peter and the Jewish men who are with him, they're all like, oh my gosh, this is really happening. Our world is upside down. 
Now the next chapter says that the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So now when Peter goes back to Jerusalem, Acts 11.2 says this, the circumcised believers criticized him. They criticized him. They're saying, what? You went to the house of a Gentile? Get away from me. You need to get outside the community, go to the outskirts and, and be quarantined like you got COVID or something like that. And one guy says, it's even worse than that. He ate with them. What? You ate with them? You're a sorry excuse for a Jewish Christian. They were still mixing and matching the old and new covenants. And a lot of the influential leaders of that day could not seem to shake what needed to be shaken. Well, meanwhile, persecution of the way is taking place in, Ju in Jerusalem and in Judea. Believers are just fleeing to other parts of the Mediterranean world. And some believers went way up north to the city of Antioch, which is like 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Antioch is primarily a Greek and Roman city, and it's pretty wealthy. And <clears throat> there's a couple of synagogues there, but there's just not a whole lot of Jewish people that live in that area. They come to Antioch and they begin to share the message of Jesus and the good news of God's grace. And Acts 28 says, a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord in Antioch. So many that they called back for reinforcements and the church in Jerusalem sends a guy by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas gets there and there's so much that's going on, such an explosion of new believers that he needs help. So he decides to go for the big gun. This is where the story really gets interesting. Verse 25 here. Then Barnabas sent to, Sar to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for an entire year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Then comes one of the really cool verses in the New Testament. It says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. This is where the word Christian came from. Originally, it was a derogatory term. It was not a compliment. It's like redneck or deadhead, something like that. Not a compliment. But after a while, it became a badge of honor to be called a Christian. Okay, so out from Jerusalem in all directions, Christianity is spreading. It's spreading deep into the Gentile world. And the Jews back in Jerusalem were like, okay, we don't even know what to do with this. All of these Gentiles are coming in. They don't even know the Ten Commandments. They don't know any of the commandments. But yet they're becoming Christians. What are we going to do? That was the quandary that they found themselves in, and that's where we're gonna pick up the story there next week. But before we go, I have a question for all of us. Everything we talked about today, what does any of that have to do with us? I mean, we're over all that, right? Everybody's welcome, God loves everybody, Jesus loves everybody. Those first century Jews, yeah, they had to make a transition, but we're good, right? I mean, we get all this and we're good. No, we're not good. <laughs> and here's why. Lots of us, we still have this tendency to mix and match covenants. God's covenant with Israel, God's covenant with the whole world. We blend them. Churches do this all the time. Preachers do this all the time. And if you're a Bible reading person, which I hope you are, you probably have a tendency to do this as well. We still blend old covenant values and imperatives with the values and imperatives of the new covenant. And I get it, I understand, I really do. Maybe you got your first Bible when you were a little kid and no one ever took the time to tell you, oh yeah, before you start reading that, you need to know this giant book is split into two really, really big covenants. The first covenant was, is with a specific nation. The second covenant is with the whole world, people everywhere. You should probably spend most of your time over here. It's all good, it's all God, but that first one is not actually your covenant. Now let's be honest, lots of us grew up revering the Bible, but never reading it. It's pretty common in the South, revere the Bible, it's holy. Do you read it? No, it's, it's holy. Do you understand it? No, it's very old and it's holy. <laughs> when you mix and match covenants, you will get the worst of both and you'll never get the best of either. And our tendency because of our devotional books, because of our song lyrics, our tendency is to try to shave off the rough edges of the old to try to make it fit nicely with the new. But Peter and Paul and all the first century believers would tell us clearly, 
they don't play together nicely. There are two different covenants. One led to the other, but once you got the new one, you got to put the other one in its proper perspective. It's been fulfilled. It's still God's word, and we can still learn from it, and I do. But you've got to look at it with new covenant eyes, or you will live in confusion. Now, next week, I'm going to show us exactly how the first century believers finally dealt with this problem. But we're getting a handle on this book, God's Word. It's life to us. But let's, let's look at it, comprehend it, and read it with the right eyes, okay? Now, why don't we take this to God in prayer for just a moment. Lord, we're so grateful for your Word and the life that it brings to us. Thank you for shedding your light on the Old Covenant and how it led to the New Covenant. Help us to receive all that, that you have given us. And especially, Lord, help us not to just keep clinging to the Old. Help us to access and receive all that Jesus died to give us. We don't want to settle for anything less than exactly what you have for us, Lord. So help us to not live beneath our privilege. Lord, we, we know you can do this. And now we believe that you can. Help us with this, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you're doing well. We pray for you all the time. Know that you are loved, even though we're not up close and personal. You are loved, cared for, and prayed for all the time. I love you guys. I really do. I miss seeing you. Look forward to when we can be together again. Until we meet again, let me leave you with this. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the God who came still comes, and the God who spoke still speaks. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.